Good morning, everybody. This is John Heerdink. I'm the managing member of Thrive Public. I know many of you recognize me by now. We've been out uh, meeting each other for a few years in person. And then over the last year and a half or so, we've been doing these webinars. Um, I'm excited to have uh, two gentlemen today that are going to tell us a story about InMed Pharmaceuticals and Bay Medica as they've come together to build um, a very significant player in the rare can can cannabinoid uh, space, and they're one of the leaders as we speak today. Um, just so happens that Eric Adams, who's the man in the the what plaid shirt, Eric, uh, yeah, um, is happens to be an old friend of mine. Um, we're both Hoosiers uh, by trade and uh, by you know, design and, and by school, and we you know we we're good friends. And it just so happens every once in a while. That happens in, in business life. If you're in long enough, you'll cross paths with something uh, that one of your friends is working on that you get excited about. Well, that's what's happened today uh, with InMed Pharmaceuticals. Um, and on top of that, we have uh, Shane Johnson, uh, who is a doctor, uh, MD, and he is the founder of Bay Medico, which InMed is in the midst of completing an acquisition of that was announced back in the end of June and definitively last week. Uh, it's exciting to see these two come together, two minds uh, with different abilities, experiences, and excitement, uh, combined excitement about what they're working on. And just met Shane yesterday via uh, uh, another video conference and got uh, really impressed with what uh, his knowledge, mind, and excitement about the space. Uh, I will um, and remind you that uh, we'll, they're going to be, uh, I'll invite them to do a presentation here, 15, 20 minutes. And right after that, uh, we're going to do Q and A. So please feel free to send via the, the zoom chat feature, any further questions you have. I'll also check my email to see if anything came in recently. I do, uh, uh, really thank you for joining from the 25 plus countries that we now span across tribe and growing and, um, continue to send your names like you did within that. Uh, for companies that you care about, and we'll continue to do our best to get them on. Eric, if you wouldn't mind uh, saying just a couple of words about your background and uh, the exciting career you've had uh, at Abbott, et cetera, um, I'd, I'd love everybody to get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Well, I uh, have my undergraduate degree in chemistry, especially in or organic chemistry. Uh, went to international business school, and that led to uh, the initiation of my career overseas. I started in Germany with a German company called Fresenius, uh, did some sales and marketing and uh, mergers and acquisitions for them. I was recruited to join Abbott Laboratories in Chicago, uh, where I was part of the team that launched their first billion-dollar product, which was an antibiotic called Biaxin. Um, had a taste of the, of the big corporate life and decided I wanted to work for smaller companies and made the transition to biotech. So spent a number of years uh, in San Diego and then uh, transitioned to Vancouver, Canada, where I've been for the last 25 years working for a number of different companies, including uh, QLT. Uh, uh, I was the CEO of a small gene therapy company called NGene uh, and joined InMed about uh, five years ago now. Um, it really excited me, the, the amount of technology the small company had. Uh, I was impressed with uh, their vision in terms of the use of cannabinoids to treat uh, difficult to treat diseases. Um, and some of the diseases that they were targeting, you know, I, I had an affinity for, I had an understanding of, and knew that, you know, products were, were desperately needed. So um, came on board, rebuilt the management team here, rebuilt the board of directors, uh, got busy raising money so that we can execute on our scientific programs. Uh, and, you know, about a year ago, uh, Shane and I started discussions about doing some collaborations on the research side. And the more we talked to each other, the more we saw that, boy, we, we really see this whole uh, field emerging the same way and evolving the same way. Um, and, you know, we, we started getting serious about discussions about, boy, what, what could this look like if we merge these two companies? What kind of powerhouse could we build here? And uh, so that's really what we're looking to do now is to bring the two companies together uh, we're in the process now of, of working to close the transaction, which will still take a little bit of time, maybe a couple of weeks, but working diligently to make that happen uh, and then get busy integrating the companies and, uh, you know, building for the future. Thanks, sir. Shane, would you do the same? I'd let everybody know a little bit about your impressive background. And I think, are you, are, were you a Fuller 
bright scholar as well as i read I, yeah i do have uh, that dubious distinction as well um <laughs> so yeah shane, shane johnson C, ceo and one of the three uh co-founders of bay medica um my i have an undergraduate degree in neuroscience uh went to uh, medical school as john mentioned was at stanford uh ended up getting pulled into a small biotech that one of my um professors had started to, to help him out uh rewrite the business plan, et cetera. And, and uh, ultimately what I thought was going to take be a three month detour ended up being a two year detour. And I decided to stay in the biotech world. So I uh, went to work with another startup company, ultimately landed more in the, the realm of strategy consulting. Uh, I was with LEK Consulting for, for uh, several years, um, focused again in the biotech sector, uh, dabbled briefly in venture capital, which is actually how I originally met Eric uh, nearly 20 years ago. Probably 15, 16, 17, something like that. So yeah. we've we've stayed in in not close contact by any stretch, but every now and then touched base over the years. And and again, serendipitously happen to both now find ourselves in the same broadly speaking industry of cannabinoid science. Um, yeah, I became very interested in cannabinoids from a health and wellness perspective about eight, nine years ago when I credit cannabis with saving the life of my neighbor's eldest son. And I realized that the plant had a lot of limitations. And so that ultimately is what uh, spurred me to reach out and, and start a dialogue with somebody who I've known for many years, uh, Chuck Marlowe, a brilliant organic chemist. And he pulled in another former colleague of his, Phil Barr, another organic chemist. And long and short, you know, we, we got our, put our heads together and said, let's start Bay Medica and Bay Medica we've leveraged both synthetic biology Phil is actually a 30-year veteran a true pioneer in the realm of synthetic biology and specific yeast engineering uh, and Chuck is a very gifted synthetic chemist and we we decided to kind of pool those resources and uh, uh, start start Bay Medica uh, focused on leveraging uh, non-plant touching technologies uh, out of the biotech sector to make rare cannabinoids and so um, you know with that maybe hand it back over. I think we've got a, a short presentation to go through, as he said, and then some Q&A. Thank, thank you. Eric, would you please uh, pull up your presentation again? And uh, let's take sure. it. Glad to do that. And again, remind everybody to uh, please send over your questions as you're going along here and uh, to be the chat feature, and we'll do our best to get them answered today. Thanks again for, for being here with us. Yeah, so let me just jump in and start talking about uh, the companies and what we're intending to do here. So it's important that everyone uh, realize that we are a publicly listed company. We're traded on the NASDAQ under the symbol INM. Um, and as such, it's important that everyone takes a moment to look over the forward looking statements, which uh, some of which we will be making today. Um, just to talk a little bit about InMed. So we are a pharmaceutical company. Everyone on our staff, all the executives have 20 to 30 years experience in pharmaceutical drug development and biotechnology. Um, we have developed a uh, proprietary approach for, for manufacturing cannabinoids called Integrison. Uh, and that was necessary because we just couldn't get to these rare cannabinoids out of the plant in any meaningful quantity. Uh, but what we're doing is we're looking at specific rare cannabinoids and their potential to treat a number of different diseases. Um, we are looking initially at dermatology as well as ocular diseases. Uh, we think that there's a strong um, case to be made for the use of cannabinoids there. And so we're, we've spent uh, you know, the last five years doing a lot of preclinical investigation, trying to figure out uh, which cannabinoid may have therapeutic potential in which diseases. And what we landed on is uh, in both dermatology and ocular diseases is the rare cannabinoid CBN or cannabinol. Um, we are now getting ready to kick off a phase two clinical trial in a rare uh, skin disease, a genetic skin disease called epidermolysis bullosa, which is one of the most devastating diseases you'll ever, you'll ever see. Um, <clears throat> currently, there's no treatments available for it, but we think we have a, a very clear shot at uh, showing that uh, cannabinol uh, has a role to play in both uh, mitigating the symptoms as well as potentially modifying the disease. So two very important endpoints there. In ocular disease, we're also using CBN as an eye drop uh, to treat glaucoma. Uh, and we're still preclinical there. Uh, we have some work to do, but uh, you know, towards the end of 2022, we're uh, hoping to be in human clinical trials with that product as well. 
Um, so as I said, we have a very experienced uh, team. Everything that we do on the pharmaceutical side is you know, going through the FDA pathway, going through the different phases of clinical trials through to regulatory approval. So it's, uh, you know, it's a longer timeline. Um, it's uh, you know, high investment, but it's also high reward if we're successful in developing compounds that bring benefit uh, to these patients. Shane, maybe you could talk more about the Bay Medica side. Absolutely. So um, as I already mentioned, uh, Bay Medica was really founded on the premise of leveraging both synthetic <clears throat> biology and uh, synthetic chemistry to make uh, rare cannabinoids. I'll talk a little bit more about how those play together uh, you know, later on in this presentation. Um, we also, and this is an area of, of overlap and, and significant interest with, within med, we have also developed, um, you leverage these same technological approaches to, to synthesis of cannabinoids to make a number of novel analogs or a library of novel analogs. Those are basically new chemical entities that are protectable in terms of a patent position. Uh, and, um, you know, we're able to make some of these compounds and they really are only well suited for pharmaceutical development, whereas naturally occurring rare cannabinoids also may have applicability in the health and wellness sectors more over the counter, as it were. Uh, on, in the health and wellness sector, we have started generating revenue. We have a one, one product that's been in the market now for uh, over a year and a half. Um, you know, we had some, had some uh, lull in sales with the pandemic, et cetera, but we've generated about two and a half million dollars, a little over two and a half million dollars in uh, sales of our lead product, uh, cannabichromine or CBC. Uh, we make that now in 200 kilo batch sizes, have the ability to scale it up to metric tons through third party uh, manufacturing partners under GMP conditions. And we are poised to launch some additional cannabinoids, high value cannabinoids in the coming, uh, you know, months and quarters. Yeah. So, uh, we'll, we'll walk through the story a little bit. We're a little bit limited on time today, so we won't spend as much time going into detail. Um, but you know, certainly take time to look at the slides. Uh, what's important about this acquisition of Bay Medica is that number one, it creates uh, the leading uh, manufacturer in the market for rare cannabinoids. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about that, but you combine what we're doing with what they're doing, uh, and it, it makes uh, certainly a, a leadership position. Um, the commercial opportunity, as I mentioned, uh, pharmaceuticals is much longer term. You know, when you do have success there, you can have products that are hundreds, several hundred million dollars per year. Uh, there are some pharmaceutical products that sell as much as $20 billion per year for a single product. But again, that's longer term. And so uh, it, it just takes time to develop. Uh, on the health and wellness side, which is where Bay Medica uh, lives, uh, you know, it's a much more immediate, you know, you can be launching products uh, with, with uh, you know, a regularity uh, and you can be building revenues there. So I think it's a nice marriage of short-term and long-term financial gain. Um, as as uh, Shane alluded to, they have a library of really interesting proprietary patented molecules that we can now start to screen to see if there are additional pharmaceutical products or hits there uh, that we can develop. And um, you know, there's a slide in here that talks about the depth and breadth of the expertise of the different management teams, uh, but they dovetail really nicely on a number of different ways uh, to just really build a, a strong uh, leadership for the company. Uh, in terms of the, the cannabinoid manufacturing expertise, um, you know, we have this Integrasense system, which is an enzyme or enzymatic biotransformation system where we are using uh, biosynthesis to make a specific enzyme that is very high powered that can really drive uh, the production of cannabinoids in a commercial setting. Um, and so it's, it's kind of quasi in between the biosynthesis and, and chemical synthesis. It's kind of a unison of those, of those two know-hows. Um, we then have Bay Medica who has deep specialty uh, and knowledge in scaling up uh, both chemical synthesis as well as yeast biosynthesis. So in, you know, in kind of one company, we're gonna have access to a whole suite of technologies and know-hows in order to best select uh, which process is best for which cannabinoid because no one of these processes uh, is best for all cannabinoids. You have to have a suite of different approaches and it depends on which specific cannabinoid you're trying to make it depends on how much of it you're trying to make. Are you making kilograms or are you making tons? Uh, and what quality you need to manufacture it at? What are the requirements? So it's different for over-the-counter products than it is for a pharmaceutical-grade product. 
So once you know those three things, you can really kind of select which one of these are going to be, um, you know, most appropriate. Shane, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I just like to mention here, I, I think it's worth stepping back for a moment and thinking about the, uh, the plant itself, the cannabis sativa, whether it's the hemp variety or the marijuana variety uh, that people, people are more accustomed to and think about. In the plant, there have now been over 140 different cannabinoids identified as being naturally occurring in the plant. Only a small portion of those are actually derived directly from a biosynthetic process, meaning, again, enzymes and, and biological reactions taking place in the plant. Um, the vast majority are uh, the results of uh, kind of degradation and other chemical reactions taking place with those as the, the, you know, other, the, the smaller cohort of cannabinoids as a starting point. So whether it's UV light hitting the plant, whether it's change in temperature, chemical reactions are taking place. So already the plant guides us to uh, the fact that if we really want to be able to make the broad array of these rarer cannabinoids, each of which likely has some distinct uh, advantages and disadvantages in terms of, uh, you know, specific effects, um, then it, we, we probably need to be looking at multiple different technologies. So it's exciting for us to have, you know, what we bring to the table, add to that Integris and all of that under one umbrella, there's a, a lot we can do. Absolutely. So this really just kind of depicts the fact that you have on the left hand side, the pharmaceutical business, which, uh, you know, is in med. Uh, we have our clinical program ongoing in epidermal lysis bullosa and uh, glaucoma. Um, and, you know, we have the ability to screen for uh, new pharmaceutical compounds uh, that, that may play a role. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the consumer health and wellness space, which is uh, Bay Medica's expertise. And really where the two companies overlap is with this extensive cannabinoid manufacturing expertise. So it's kind of a natural fit um, and, uh, you know, makes us kind of unique in the industry in terms of our abilities across the board. Um, just to touch briefly on the patents, uh, you know, it's uh, a growing library on both sides of the equation. Um, you know, most importantly for us on the pharmaceutical side is looking at Bay Medica's library of new analogs. So taking the naturally occurring cannabinoids and converting them slightly to increase their potential to treat disease or increasing their safety profile or some other aspect of it that, uh, that makes it a, a patentable compound. Uh, combined, the two companies have 12 patent families and seven of those are on manufacturing. So that really gives you an idea um, as to the um, uh, importance of manufacturing uh, in this space. And important to point out that uh, as well as with Integris and Bay Medica retains all the rights to their own patents. Uh, so, you know, we have internalized these and we, we own everything that we're working on. Uh, Shane, maybe you could talk a few minutes about uh, what the uh, rollout looks like for you guys. Sure. I already mentioned that, um, you know, we're focused on rare cannabinoids. And again, when people think of non-rare cannabinoids, you think of THC and CBD that are relatively accessible out of the plant. And then these rare cannabinoids that occur in nature in much smaller quantities. We've already commercialized CBC, as I mentioned. Um, there are some other very high value uh, cannabinoids, um, some of which are, are already have generated some, some very meaningful interest in the markets uh, that we are in the process of scaling up. Um, specifically, CBDV and THCV are probably the next two in our in our direct pipeline. Uh, you know, people see the letters THC and THCV and they and they sometimes get a little confused, but it's it's actually not uh, intoxicating, unlike THC itself that people are familiar with, and rather than giving you the munchies, is actually thought to reduce uh, appetite. So, uh, you know, clearly uh, something of, 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 of quite a bit of interest in the consumer realm. Um, and then you can see there's a whole, whole host of others that we have at various stages of development. We've made over 20 different uh, cannabinoids that are naturally occurring at this point, as well as, again, that, that wider, broad array of, of novel analogs. Um, you know, this is a market that's expected to grow substantially. I mean, this is one analyst's suggestion of, of what they believe the uh, biosynthetic or synthetic uh, cannabinoid market will grow to, to be over the coming years. So you can see today, pretty darn small, uh, growing, they, they're saying, to over, over $100 billion over the course of uh, the next couple of decades. So uh, we're looking at a, an overall market that has substantial 
uh, growth potential. Um, you know, we can spend a lot more time talking about, you know, the nuances of this, uh, you, you know, but I think that ultimately right now today, a lot of this, you know, a lot of the, what's out there still is the THC and CBD. There is a growing interest in these minor or rare cannabinoids uh, as they apply to specific conditions and, 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 and applications in the consumer realm, uh, such as, you know, sleep, anxiety, et cetera. Uh, just a little bit more on our uh, current commercial product, CBC. Uh, as I already mentioned, we're a we're a leader in terms of large batch supply. Uh, you know, 200 kilo batches. We are exclusively focused on B2B sales. Uh, we don't have any of our own finished goods. Uh, importantly, one of the key reasons we chose CBC. Well, the science led us there. Number one, but number two, it is not intoxicating. It's not scheduled by the DEA. So we had we felt like we had a very clear uh, and clean regulatory. Uh, framework within, within which we could operate. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have over two and a half million dollars in lifetime sales to date. We're growing very nicely on that on a, on a, on a you know, quarter over quarter basis, year over year. So uh, very, very pleased with that. And ultimately, we know we can do a lot more. We have plans, uh, you know, post uh, close to add in some additional, you know, sales and marketing talent to really drive that, uh, you know, forward. Um, I'm going to just uh, skip over. I'll mention that there is a slide here that talks about the depth of the executive teams uh, that we have here, uh, tremendous uh, scientists as well as uh, administrative people. Uh, please take a chance to look at that. Um, from a financial snapshot, uh, you know, here's where we are right now. Uh, we, in, in March 31st, we reported uh, $9.5 million in cash. Uh, since then, we've done a uh, private placement that uh, netted us an additional $11 million. Um, so that number is not mentioned in there. Um, our audited financials for our year end, June 30th, are slet, uh, set to come out uh, later this week. So uh, you'll have access to that. Um, but uh, this is the short term uh, milestones and, and uh, you know, the way to drive shareholder value. Um, we're going to continue to focus on, uh, you know, increasing the revenues of the current product that's been launched, uh, the CBC product, uh, and as quickly as possible, launch several new cannabinoids into the B2B consumer packaged goods space. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with integrating the manufacturing teams, uh, you know, prioritizing the different projects and making sure that they're appropriately funded. On the drug development side, uh, we are set to initiate the phase two trial uh, in EB. Uh, in, in the coming weeks, uh, we are going to continue to build towards a, uh, a human clinical trial with the 088 product in glaucoma. Um, and so that's what the better part of the next year will be. Uh, as well, we're going to continue to screen new pharmaceutical candidates from the Bay Medical Library of Proprietary Analogs. So, uh, John, I thought I would, I would stop there just so we can have uh, some time to uh, uh, you know, take some questions and uh, that talk specifically great. about what the interest might be. That's great. Uh, thank, thanks, Eric and Shane. That was, uh, it, it, it's a truly exciting to catch you guys at this time on the tribe uh, for a number of reasons, in my opinion. And just to remind everybody that uh, maybe that new to uh, tribe is that I also run uh, Vista Partners. Vista's Partners is my uh, investment arm and it's structured as a registered investment advisor. And uh, so, uh, I, and as full disclosure, please go to that website too and see my, my disclaimer, but know that I'm invested in InMed and I've been buying shares. Um, I'm kind of shocked the stock is around the $2 level right now. Uh, that's my personal opinion. You do your own evaluation. And if you're not a financial advisor, or hedge fund manager, portfolio manager, please consult your consultants, as they say, and advisors. But I, I like where I'm catching this. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I know uh, the management is not because they're shareholders too, uh, where the stock is. And I'm, um, but I think this is a very interesting time to be weighing into this company as these two companies combine and this in industry emerges. Um, one of the questions that has come up, Eric, uh, from the tribe here is in relation to um, how are you set up to really evolve from a marketing perspective uh, this going forward, you know, as you've been working on therapeutic and then launch and then the development of Integrison, um, maybe speak to where you are with Integrison again a little bit 
And then also with Bay Medica coming in there, what, what are the assets that combine that you're going to be able to bring to the table to really push this global marketing uh, uh, project that you have going forward? Yeah. Yeah, well, on the manufacturing front, as we said, you know, we have developed Integrison specifically to meet the needs of InMed, which is on the pharmaceutical side of things. So we are convinced that for a number of reasons, um, we have developed a very low cost approach to making these at pharmaceutical grade. The difference between consumer grade and pharmaceutical grade uh, has a lot to do with control of the process. Um, it has to do, with, like Shane says, with a lot of clipboards uh, that have to be checked and signed. Uh, but essentially, it's anywhere from five to 10 times more expensive to make a pharmaceutical grade product. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've kind of modified the approach to doing that so that we can lower those costs as much as possible. So Integrison is intended to be primarily for pharmaceutical, but it may have applications outside of that. And that's what we need to figure out as we integrate the two teams uh, with all this manufacturing expertise. Um, Shane and his team have developed chemical uh, scale-up processes as well as biosynthetic processes that we think are going to uh, play a bigger role on the, uh, on the consumer side of things. So it's really combining the know-how of these two companies and figuring out what the best approach is, uh, approaches and then making sure that we fund it appropriately to get to whatever milestones we're trying to hit. Um, from a commercial launch standpoint, uh, there are... A, several uh, cannabinoids, as Shane mentioned, that they are in the process of scaling up. Uh, we would anticipate those to be launched in the next uh, couple of quarters. Um, you know, we'll have to get together. And, and again, we need to uh, figure out, you know, how best to, to do this and what the exact timelines are. And we'll be glad to report on that uh, after the integration of the companies. Um, but, uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, Shane and his team have been responsible for generating the sales and, and, and being out there. Again, it's a B2B approach. It's not a consumer approach. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Something that you can manage with a much smaller team. They've been incredibly successful to date, but I think that's one of the areas where we definitely want to uh, augment uh, what we already have uh, with a sales and marketing professional to really take that on and, and uh, elevate that as much as possible. Um, you know, one of the things that we could bring to it, I mean, I've been on the commercial side, I've, you know, been in sales and marketing uh, for, for several years in the pharmaceutical side. Uh, we've got several members of our board who have extensive commercial experience. So we can bring quite a bit to that discussion uh, and support the, those programs as we, uh, as we build them out. And I, I would assume some, uh, uh, you know, like yourself, you've got certain logos in your background when doing that with Abbott's and are there some of the other logos that uh, some of the other board members that you could throw out to just understand sort of that? <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, we've got people with experience um, in, in biotech as well as uh, in big pharma, mm -hmm. um, you know, Takeda, uh, Abbott, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the company in Seattle. Um, uh, anyways, you know, we, we've all kind of been around the block a few different times, right? Sure. So I've, I've been in, in on commercial products uh, at uh, Advanced uh, Tissue Sciences where we were selling, you know, human skin. I've been in the oncology space. I've been in the AIDS arena. I've been in antibiotics. Uh, I've been in renal dialysis, you know, so, so you, you do enough of those things and you start to get a perspective coming from a lot of different angles on how to approach these kinds of markets. And so that's something that we, we think we can bring to this discussion. Okay, great. But, but you were with QLT, one of the most successful biotechs out of, uh, out of Canada, correct? Yeah, yeah. I was in charge of their oncology program there. Yeah. So we were we had a product that was in the market you know, probably in uh, 15 countries uh, that, that we were generating revenues. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and getting back, I know you mentioned you, you had this financing with an institutional investor in July, right around the same time that you announced the uh, intent to acquire Baymedica. Um, it, 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 uh, not to put words in your mouth, but I believe that this is, that's what this was for. This was to really put you in a strong position to go out and market and to penetrate this and develop this um, uh, process to, to the extent that you need to. So for the foreseeable future, uh, yeah. what, are you, what are you saying right now this, this money takes you? Where, where does it take you at this point? Yeah, I mean, we, we easily have, uh, you know, 12 to 15 months cash in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that is negating any revenues. So as we start to generate revenues, 
uh, with Baymedica's products, that just adds to the to the runway. I think you know we have to launch uh, a few more of these to really see how quickly this market can grow. I think we're optimistic that it can grow quite rapidly, uh, and we want to be right in the middle of of that and, and be a player. Uh, each of the cannabinoids that we're looking at introducing, just the way Shane and his team have launched CBC, we intend to be the leader. We intend to be the low cost manufacturer, uh, and we intend to uh, you know attract really good margins um, on the products that that we are selling. So. Uh, you know, we're not going into the CBD arena. Uh, that's a uh, that's a low cost commodity now. Um, by low cost, you can you can get that for five hundred dollars per kilogram. Uh, some of the cannabinoids that we're launching, they're currently selling for ninety thousand per kilogram. Um, they have to sell them for ninety thousand because it's costing them eighty five thousand to make them. Uh, you know, we're we're going to come in, you know, with a uh, very low manufacturing cost uh, that will allow us to sell these for twenty thousand. Uh, or, or even less, and still have a very high margin on these products. Um, so, so that's our intent. But you know, we we don't want to play in in the commodity arena. Uh, that's where THC and CBD currently are. <clears throat> we think CBG will be the next one that's selling for pennies, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but these other rare cannabinoids, uh, we're pretty excited about. And we think there's a great opportunity there. Gotcha. And then, and the the gross margins on the current product, Shane, that you've got out there and de uh, derives two and a half million dollars of revenues. What, is there a range that we're falling in today with where you are in the development? Yeah, we we have not shared that publicly uh, at this point. I think that that's one that once you know post closing, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at kind of what the, what do we think the pro forma looks like and share some more forward looking guidance guidance as appropriate. In particular, leveraging the skill set of Bruce Caldwell in Med CFO, who is not on this call today. So uh, yeah, we're not providing that guidance. I, what I will say is you know we we certainly have positive gross margin. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the fact that we've had revenues has been a big part in, in uh, keeping Bay Medica in business, uh, especially through the pandemic. So, um, fair enough. Thank you. And um, uh, I guess one follow up question to that, maybe Eric, maybe you have this answer is, is there a target sort of uh, gross margin profile that you're going to be looking at, you know, hitting over the next year, ideally, is there any sort of range that you would throw out? For those who are not as familiar with this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, we don't really want to give guidance just yet. I think there's still a lot to be figured out. Um, okay. Importantly, as we scale these things up from, say, um, you know, kilograms to hundreds of kilograms to tons, you know, you start to see real improvement in, in your margins. So I'm not quite sure where we are on that sliding scale. Again, that's something that we have to get, you know, get our hands uh, dirty uh, with Bay Medica and, you uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not so much that we, we haven't done that in due diligence, but I think there's opportunities to really improve on that. Uh, but again, you know, focusing on these rare cannabinoids where there's already a very high demand, I get calls from people and we don't even sell anything <laughs> uh, uh, in med, but I get calls from people asking to, to buy all these different rare cannabinoids. Uh, and they tell me, you know, well, I could get it for 120,000 per kilo from this other guy, but he could only give me one kilo and I need 50. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, hi, we, we, I'm sorry, we don't do that right now, but give my buddy Shane a call and talk to him because uh, he's a lot closer to that than I am. Well, maybe, maybe uh, that's a good lead, uh, leading into next question uh, that at least pops in my mind is regards to who are the buyers of this? Who are you trying to sell to today? And then who are the buyers of the future? Where does this industry go? What do they look like? Um, I think very simply, you know, today's buyers for our product, again, we're, we're B2B, we predominantly are selling to existing distributors and white label manufacturers operating in the quote unquote CBD space. So, uh, for, and, and it's predominantly here in the US to date, there are international opportunities, we have shipped small quantities here and there overseas, but, but by and large, right now, our bread and butter is here in the United States, as I said, mostly distributors and white label manufacturers. Manufacturers um, who, who are working with, you know, hemp CBD, as it were. I think as we move forward, we're still in the very early phases of this industry. Uh, as we move forward, you're going to see more and more mainstream CPG companies, uh, you know, starting to play ball uh, or, or wanting to get into the sector. And you're already starting to see that with things like cosmetics, where the regulatory framework around cosmetics is a little bit cleaner. You know, most consumers aren't aware of this, but 
right now today, the FDA says on their website, don't put CBD into any ingestible products because the FDA considers CBD to be a drug. It's one of the reasons also that we're not doing CBD ourselves, but that's kind of the framework in which to operate. We expect that that, that landscape, the regulatory framework, whether it's through the FDA or whether it's through Congress, uh, probably higher probability, in, in my opinion, of the latter, that, that Congress ends up passing a new law, basically enabling uh, m more business opportunities in this sector around health and wellness. Because I think we've come to recognize that, you know, this plant does some pretty unique things and it doesn't just get you high. It does a lot of other beneficial things. Sure. Well, that makes sense. And I guess combined with sort of these regulatory hurdles being sort of knocked down, uh, going forward and uh, your ability to be able to control the creation of products, it could evolve into the hands of the Nestle's of the world, et cetera, once they, you know, when all of this evolves, is that correct? Or are you from, from your lips to God's ears? Yes. Uh, you know, and, and I think ultimately what we do plays very well to the needs of a Nestle or a Coca-Cola or some larger player because they don't necessarily want their supply chain to be subject to a massive hailstorm that swept the Rocky Mountain West and the entire hemp crop is destroyed or pesticides somehow floated over from the neighbor's farm because of course the farm we acquire from, you know, do doesn't use pesticides but it must be the neighboring property that did that and contaminated our product. So, you know, when you're making things under controlled environment, GMP conditions and stainless steel vats, and it's very easy to build redundant supply chains because of that type of process, you know, that's the type of thing that a mainstream CPG company wants. They don't want any surprises. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, continuing on this about the space, um, question comes in for both you and uh, Shane and Eric, it says, how active are the scientific and academic and pharma communities in terms of research into cannabinoids uh, uh, and the uh, human endo cannabinoid <laughs> system? There you go. It's a lot of work, a lot, lot for me on a, on a morning. So I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, Eric, and then sure. you, can, you can, can carry on. But, uh, you, you know, look, I think I think what we're seeing right now, I mean, there, there's been research done over decades into this sector, but really a lot of it has been stifled by the fact that, uh, you, you know, marijuana was considered devil's weed and, and the whole war on drugs and it being a schedule one, meaning zero potential medicinal benefit. That's what schedule one drug means. And that's how cannabis has been classified, including the hemp plant, by the way, for, for decades here in the US and because of the United States lead, it ultimately globally. So what we're seeing, even though pharma has done certain things with cannabinoids, uh, you know, in previous decades, they were, they were looking at it from a, I'll call it a pharma-centric view in terms of developing things that are high tight binding affinities to particular receptors. And what we're really finding is that the endocannabinoid system doesn't work that way. And these compounds actually brush or touch a bunch of different receptors in the body. CBD, depending who you believe, what, what researcher, uh, you know, touches, it touches or binds to affects anywhere from 20 to 63 different receptors in the human body. Um, so you can imagine that's quite complex, but this is an area that researchers are active starting to pursue more. You know, it, it's easier for people to be able to get source material to make it in their lab without needing a schedule one license, you know. So this is this is the type of thing where there's absolutely a, a, a growing uh, body of scientific data. We're still in the early stages of it. I mean, it's a shock to me with a medical background that I never learned a single thing about the endocannabinoid, despite going to one of arguably the best medical schools in the world. And, and, and here you have something that fundamentally is part of our, uh, you know, maintaining homeostasis in our bodies. So it's, it's pretty unique. It's a unique opportunity for science. Uh, and it's a unique opportunity for companies like us that are, you know, helping to pioneer, uh, you know, some, some enabling, uh, you know, technologies. Yeah, just to and just to break that down, <laughs> uh, you know, the the human body produces two cannabinoids itself called endocannabinoids, and then we have these receptors literally throughout our body that that work with those drugs that the body makes endogenously, uh, and that's why we have such a close relationship with this plant. This plant makes 140 different cannabinoids, and we already have all the receptors to to interact differently with different cannabinoids. 
Uh, and as Shane alluded to, it's not just the endocannabinoid receptors, the ones in our body, but it's a whole host of other receptors in our body that also react with this. So the human uh, body has a natural relationship with the cannabis plant in a number of different ways. We're just trying to elucidate what are the what are the therapeutic benefits? You know, forget the intoxicating one. We don't care about intoxication. That's what THC does uh, and one or two of its, its nephews, but no other cannabinoid does that. What else does it, do, it, does it do? Well, we know that CBD works in epilepsy. So it does something interesting in the brain. We know, you know that it works in inflammation. We, we have a whole host of things that we've learned about CBN in terms of what it does in the human body. So it's really trying to understand that um, you know, and, and that kind of has uh, a role in both the health and wellness space as well as in the pharmaceutical space. Okay. Thank you, Eric and Shane. Um, uh, one of the, the tribe here has glaucoma and uh, is taking, uh, I guess in his case, he's taking three drops uh, plus other genetics or generics. Um, I guess, what do you, what you're developing, how does that differentiate? And related to that, another question had come in in regards to, you know, what are the current frontline therapeutics picture today? And why are you working on this? What is, can you, can you speak to that a little bit more? Sure, specifically in glaucoma. So um, there's some great drugs out there that lower the interocular pressure. And what happens in glaucoma is that fluid builds up in the front of the eye because it, it's a natural process, but the drainage doesn't work very well. So it, it builds and builds and builds because it can't drain. That fluid pushes pressure into the eye and makes the eye, you know, pressurizes it. And that pressure kills the nerve cells at the back of the eye that are responsible for vision. Uh, and that's irreversible. So this constant pressure, I tell people, if you push your finger down on your desk for half an hour and you lift it up, you're not going to be able to feel anything for a couple hours. Well, that constant pressure over time kills those, those nerve cells and that leads to blindness. Um, and the, the pressure itself can be painful. So what do current drugs do? Current drugs relax, it relaxes the tissue at the front of the eye so that the drainage can happen. Um, and they work, they work pretty well. Uh, cannabinoids do this as well. So there's a handful of them. THC does that, CBN does that, CBD, not really. Uh, but there's a number of them that will mimic that as well. So we can provide the same kind of benefit as what current drugs can. Um, what we think the advantages are gonna be is number one, that the side effect profile will be very minimal with cannabinoids. Um, number two, uh, and again, we need to prove this out in human clinical trials. Um, Number two, the current drugs that are used over time, their effect diminishes. So people have to switch to another one or another one, um, which doesn't sound very bad. But if, if you're on other medications, there could be drug-drug interactions that you have to be aware of. There may be different dosing schedules. So it could get confusing over time. Um, apparently, uh, and there's a publication out there that says cannabinoids don't have that effect. The body doesn't get used to cannabinoids. So you may never have to switch off of them once you start. Again, we'll have to prove that in clinical trials, but that could be a really huge benefit. But most importantly, cannabinoids and specifically CBN does something really interesting. And that is it goes to the nerve cells at the back of the eye and it protects them from cell death. So you have a dual effect here. Number one, you can reduce the pressure, which is causing problems. But number two, you can proactively protect the neurons from dying and thereby extend, extend the vision. And that may be important not only in glaucoma, but you think of other diseases like diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration or some of these other ones where you can protect the neurons from dying. Now, cannabinoids do this in several different cell types. And I think that's probably what's going on with CBD in the brain for epilepsy is it's protecting these neurons somehow. So we're, we're working to understand that a little bit better. We think it's that duality of effect that's gonna be really important. Thank you. Uh, anything to add to that, Shane? Or you... No, I think that was a fairly comprehensive answer, at least at a high <laughs> level, unless you wanna go, go, go for a deep dive on- uh, There you go. Uh, <laughs> Physiology. I, I happened when I did my neuroscience undergrad, I, I graduate degree, I actually happened to study retinal ganglion cells. So it's something I, 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 I you know, would have to dust off the cobwebs, but I do have some remote. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, well, I'm sure history you get, there. 
I'm sure as you two continue to combine, you're gonna, you're gonna, these these different layers of experiences are gonna start to come to the surface and add real value, just like that came out of nowhere. Oh yeah, I did that. You know, I can see that with you and uh, <laughs> layers of understanding there. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Uh, quick uh, on a on a uh, switching over uh, back to Integerson, if you will, Eric. Uh, one of the shareholders, uh, tribe members here, is asking. I guess there was a Forbes article sometime in the last couple of years that came away very impressed in his opinion uh, with your integrity process. I don't know if you're familiar with that article. When that was, he suggesting it was in eighteen, um, and to see yeah. if there's if you're seeing uh, interest around that. That since you've evolved it, you know the two announcements mm -hmm. this year alone where you've reduce the cost are you seeing inbound companies circling are you seeing you know uh media come come to you what would you say to that yeah so uh again the the integerson process was developed specifically to benefit uh you know a low cost pharmaceutical grade product mm -hmm. um the issue that that's you know well, it's not an issue but but right now the reality is there's only a couple of companies pursuing uh, pharmaceutical grade cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. uh, there's GW Pharma who grows and extracts their CBD. There's Zynerba who uses CBD. That's a synthetic version. Uh, there's a couple other companies who use CBD and I don't know where they source it from. Um, and then there's us, we, we're doing CBN. Um, I'm not aware of any other companies pursuing pharmaceutical programs for rare cannabinoids. So there's, GW, there's sorry to interrupt, but GW was was acquired, wasn't it? What was it? They were acquired by Jazz Pharmaceuticals for seven billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're probably on track to do a billion dollars with their CBD product. Um, you know, uh, probably you know in the next twelve to eighteen months. So you know that that kind of again goes back to what I said earlier about, about the tremendous payoff for a pharmaceutical investment uh, if you're able to bring benefit to patients you know, a billion dollars for that product that probably is bigger than all other CBD sales of any kind over the counter that's out there, right? I mean, it's, it's such an impressive uh, home run. Um, so, so no, we haven't had a lot of people come to us simply because we're not, no one needs pharmaceutical grade cannabinoids yet. Um, so we, we develop for our own internal purposes. And again, what we have to do now is work with Shane's team who has a lot of experience in scaling up and, and commercial scale to say, well, okay, the integration process has some interesting components that we can add here and we can tack on and build with uh, in order to launch cannabinoids into the health and wellness space. So at the end of the day, I don't think anyone is saying, oh, we got to have that process. Mm -hmm. I think people are saying, where can I get products? Uh, and, and that's what they're looking for is, you know, I want, I want, you know, CBDV, I want THCV, I want CBC, where can I get them? And at the end of the day, as long as they're made to a um, you know very high quality, uh, then they don't care how it's actually made, right? No, no one says, "Boy, got to get me some of that Integris in CBC." Yeah. They just want CBC, and they want yeah. it cheap. <laughs> Got it. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> have, so switching over to the you know the capital market side of this, you've um, since the announcement of the acquisition, you've had uh, at least one sell side analyst come out, um, uh, Scott Henry over at Roth Capital, I believe in the uh, July right after that July night time frame after you made uh, brought in the the twelve million dollar gross or eleven plus uh, net uh, in proceeds from institutional investor, he came out with a report that he called INM favorable take on Bay Medica LOI and uh, included a 12 month target price of $11.50. Mind you, I don't know, I'm not looking at the chart, uh, stock right now, but it was, it's uh, been around $2 and you know, 18, 20 million market cap. Um, not much off of cash right now. Uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's crazy. It's yeah. Yeah. And so it's an interesting time, like I said, uh, from a value perspective, in my opinion, to be looking at uh, InMed. The other uh, yesterday, I believe Edison uh, issued a research report and they had a $20 target price. I like the sound of $11.50 or $20, uh, especially when we're at $2 a day. That's a nice return. And I'm always looking at 10, 20, uh, 30x types of returns when I'm investing in companies uh, in this market cap range. Um, and I think this has the potential 
Um, do you, are you also seeing attention since this acquisition uh, from other sell side uh, analysts uh, approaching you and to understand at least what, what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can't go into details, but, um, you know, we have been discussing this with a number of different analysts. Uh, there, there is some interest there. Um, I think you'll start to see, you know, more coverage, more reports coming out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I mean, to your point, we're, we're, we're down there almost trading for cash, which is absurd. Uh, you know, why is that? Well, the, the, the cannabis sector in general has taken a, quite a beat down over the last year. And unfortunately, we're, you know, we, we're considered cannabis adjacent. You know, we're not a cannabis company, but we're kind of in the same field. So we get wrapped in with them. Uh, we're in some of the indexes, you know, for cannabis. So if that goes down, we go down, right? Um, and we, we're, we're trying to educate people that, you know, we're beyond that. We're kind of a, a different breed. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think we're, we'll, we'll continue to strive to do that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, um, it, it's been a real uh, head scratcher. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what this acquisition does for us is it gives us the opportunity to put some serious points up on the board. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're taking the field, people can point at you and say, they don't have a chance. Oh, these guys, oh, $2 stock, right? Uh, but once you get out there and you start putting points on the board with revenues and margins and new product launches, those are points that can't come off the board. <laughs> those go up on the board and they stay there. And I think we have an opportunity here. Uh, you know, with the acquisition to put some points up in the short term. Um, you know, we have a number of big drivers that we're going to be hitting uh, with our therapeutic programs, uh, you know, in the next, uh, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's what it's going to be all about is putting points up on the board and, you know, saying, well, you can, you can, you know, uh, the naysayers can continue to nay, but uh, it's hard to, um, you know, it's, it's hard to argue with success. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I tell you what, uh, from my experience in developing companies as well and being around advising, like uh, um, hopefully adding some value here as we get, uh, as I got involved, is I've seen a real change in the personality and the excitement around the company when you start to bring in dollars. The great thing is by jumpstarting that process, by tucking in Bay Medica, you already have that and you're growing. I think it was a 30% clip quarter over quarter. So this is going to change, I think, uh, just the feeling around InMed um, with this coming in. Obviously, you're bringing in some great minds, but you're also bringing in revenues. When you see dollars start to come in as opposed to only going out, it's a whole different ballgame. And it's probably going to excite and draw other uh, attention and attracting talent further beyond this because of that alone. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons I'm excited to catch you right now. And uh, you know, whoever wanted to sell the stock, you know, thank you for doing that. And, um, you know, I'll continue to, to, as you develop, continue to add to it. I've always been a guy that, you know, I, I never exactly know the exact right price to buy it, but I like to average in, get to know things and really learn from the process. And if there's anything I can bring to the table to, um, to add value, I try to do that as well as many of you know. So again, took a little bit longer today than we normally do, but it was the first time we've had in Met on here. And uh, I would just say, uh, Eric is, and Shane, is there anything you'd like to end here um, uh, before, before I sign off? Or is there anything like that? I think we've uh, done a good job of covering it. I would just echo, you know, I, I definitely believe that this combination with InMed, uh, you know, creates a scenario where by virtue of the different strengths we each bring to the table uh, and the complementary skill sets where one plus one definitely is going to equal something greater than the sum of, uh, of its parts. I, you know, I, I can't tell you exactly what time frame that will take or how long it'll take to put all these points on the board and have the market ac actually recognize it. But uh, we are bound and determined to make that happen. So. Yeah, and, and this, I think, is a great uh, format, uh, John. Um, I've participated in some of your other uh, events and, and got to meet some of the other CEOs of the companies that, that you cover. Uh, I, I like what you're doing here, and I'd love the opportunity to, uh, you know, do this again and, uh, you know, and just to update people. Um, you know, there's only so much we can say publicly. We're actually limited just because the, the deal hasn't officially closed. Um, you know, we're confident that it will, and, and that's why we're, we're, we're doing this uh, jointly. Um, but once it has, and once we have a chance to catch our breath and kind of understand the integration uh, and, and really, you know, focus on the strengths uh, of what the two teams bring together, 
uh, we'll be able to communicate in much uh, you know, more, more uh, exactly what it is we're setting out to do and what the time frame for that is going to be. Um, so, you know, we're not trying to be obtuse, but, you know, at the same time, we, we, we got to be really careful uh, right. about uh, providing too much forward looking guidance, uh, but, but we will get around to that. It makes sense. I think it's a good indicator that we have Shane on this program today that you're heading towards a close in a rapid pace. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so that's just, I mean, call me, uh, you know, uh, clairvoyance, but that's kind of what I would say is probably reality at this point, but uh, I'm excited to see that come to a conclusion and really, you know, you guys propel this company forward. Uh, reminder, Tribe, that uh, this video, I'll be record. Uh, this is being recorded, and I'll be having this video up the YouTube channel, and uh, so if you want to review back and, and uh, if you miss something, today, for instance, or if you want to put this out to some friends, uh, just go to the YouTube channel at Tribe Public. Uh, just do a search at Tribe Public and you'll find it uh, right on YouTube at the channel there. And we expect to get uh, a great deal of views out there. I think we're averaging over 20,000 plus views and that uh, the members keep growing there as well. So thanks again for taking the time. Uh, we'll get that up. And if there's any further follow-up questions, just send them to me um, and I'll do my best to get Eric and or Shane to address them. And we'll look to have you back soon. Thanks again, gentlemen, for uh, participating and thank you, Tribe. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.